So Charlie, share with us what brought you uh, yeah. into Howard's orbit and how long it was after you met him that you decided, I've got to make this film on him. Yeah, so uh, kind of a funny story. Uh, Howard has a, a TV version of the grand unified theory of everything in the universe, including the human soul. Um, 77 it's parts. The name at this point. But yeah, he wants. Uh, yes, the grand unified theory of everything in the universe, including sex, violence, and right. the human soul. Make it saucy for the TV crowd. Right, right. Um, so it's a 77 part series, and he uh, pitched it to uh, our, our network, Brick TV's executive producer, Aziz. And they brought Howard into our studio and interviewed him a little bit. And then Aziz showed me that footage and um, asked me if I was interested in doing something with it with Howard. And then I learned about Howard's biography and his um, amazing daily routine. And I thought maybe we should just make a documentary about Howard and kind of go from there. There was something. There was something more. True. Um, we had an election, and when the election was over a bunch of us walked around as if our hearts had been cut out, as if we were amputees. And Charlie looked at this footage and said, and he, he summed up my philosophy as surf the catastrophe. Take every catastrophe you can and turn it into an opportunity to do something radically, shockingly new. Yeah. And Charlie looked at that philosophy and he said, oh my God, if we're gonna get through the next four years, this is the philosophy we need. True, true. Yeah, no, it was, uh, yeah, amen. It was the week after the election, and, uh, and it, just that kind of, you know, uh, cosmic Trump. philosophy of zooming out, and you just, I kind of needed to pull out of, you know, November 2016 and um, consider things from a cosmic perspective, and Howard was helpful with that, so. <laughs> <laughs> so then, Howard, you get the call from, from Charlie, all right, well, let's make this film, and you decide to open up your home and your life. Uh, were you on board from the, from the get-go? Oh, or did yes, it take this is a terrific you opportunity. <laughs> Look, if you've spent every day of your life since you were 12 years old pursuing this grand unified approach that combines everything, at least everything that your limited brain can understand, and you come to understand that to have that philosophy is not enough, to gather all that information and put it together is not enough. You have to be able to inject it into the generations that come after you're gone. So having a film is perfect. It's one yeah. nail through the surface of time into the next generation. The perfect tool, yeah. So, uh, so we see in the film that you have a very uh, unique uh, schedule. Uh, I don't imagine that necessarily lends itself easily to documentary uh, capture. Actually, it does. Charlie, it does? Was, Charlie <laughs> was obsessed with filming me getting up in the morning. Okay. Now, if you have two four-hour blocks in which you sleep, you get up twice a day. It's perfect for a filmmaker. <laughs> also, Howard, uh, I need to thank you for... Um, you, like Every time we were going to film with Howard, he yeah. made a note to his assistant to remind him before he went to bed to put on underwear. Yes, uh, exactly. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that, Howard. Yeah. Uh, that would have been lovely. We, we didn't want Charlie to have a triple X rated uh, film. Yeah, yeah. Untold levels of intimacy there, yeah. Uh, <laughs> tell us about the status of your, uh, your magnum opus now. Where, where, where is it at? Um, my seventh book, Einstein, Michael Jackson, and Me, A Search for Soul in the Power Pits of Rock and Roll, is coming out in April. When I left the music industry, um, I, uh, forgive me for saying this, I was a legend. I was credited with totally reinventing publicity in the music industry. And when you've worked with Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley, et cetera, et cetera, that's what becomes, that sort of adheres to your reputation. But I came from science. At the age of 10, I got into theoretical physics and microbiology. At the age of 12, I built my first Boolean algebra machine machine and co-designed a computer that won science fair awards and had my first meeting with the head of the graduate physics department mm -hmm. at the University of Buffalo. And uh, so my obligation when I became sick, once I realized I'm just going to have to write my books from bed using a computer, was to reestablish myself in science, which was very difficult given this evil reputation of being a publicist in the music industry. <laughs> so it took, it took decades 
but now I've been published or given talks at scholarly conferences in 12 different scientific fields. So now I could finally afford to write my rock and roll memoir. There it is. Next spring, everyone. Charlie, tell us uh, what you learned in, uh, in making this film, uh, apart from putting your name on your yeah. clothing. Yeah, that's a new thing, so let's see if that <laughs> works, as well as Howard claims. Um, yeah, so, you know, this uh, started, um, I, I, this was my first feature length project, so um, I had done some, some short, a lot of short docs at, at Brick, and um, and he won three um, Emmys. Yes, thank you. He's a great publicist, this guy. <laughs> um, so this was originally, you know, we actually made like a 20-minute thing with Howard, and then Howard joined Tinder and told me about, you know, leaving everything he owns to a bodybuilder in Dubai who he'd never met, and I just, you know, we realized there was a lot more <laughs> to get into. So... So, you know, this, this project, and I think, you know, obviously every documentary has its own life um, and evolution, but um, this was really like, all right, we're just going to keep filming with Howard and see where this goes. And um, so then, you know, just in the, the, the process, I edited the film as well. Um, and so, you know, that is not fun, and I hope uh, in the future I find someone else to edit something I direct. Doing both is a, a heavy lift. Um, because you just get so close to the material. And so it took a while to figure, there's infinite ways like into Howard's story. So just um, the process of figuring out what the film was about, you know, we didn't get there till much later on. And it took a lot of, you know, viewings with friends and a lot of feedback to kind of figure out um, the, just the way to like kind of hook into Howard and be able to, um, you know, break off and kind of pull all of these disparate elements together so well you did a fine job thank you all right let's open it to the audience for uh, some questions gentlemen all the way in the back ah, question well, for Howard okay, the last that's an big easy thing. one the last big Let thing I was wrong about there you go my push-ups. <laughs> I didn't know it, but they're not push-ups. <laughs> they're, they're dynamic planking. They're, with, they're vibrations in midair. They are difficult as all hell, but they are not push-ups. Push and it took me a year after I first saw the footage to be able to confess that because that was such a vital part of my personality. <laughs> and very, very proud of you for realizing that. <laughs> yes. Well, Charlie has distilled one of the basic things that I've learned, which is um, niches are not given. There are no niches in nature. We create them. We assemble them. If we think we have run out of niches, if we think we've run out of resources, it means we've run out of imagination. And the task is to take every goddamn thing that is thrown your way, like that 15 years of being stuck in a bed, like those five years of not even being able to speak, and to mine it as a creative opportunity, to turn it into, to turn a torture into a gift. And thus, you know, there's this line um, from Andrew Marvel. Um, Let us take all our strength and all our joy and roll it up into one ball and roll it up with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our son stand still, yet we will make him run. You're only given one lifetime. It has a limited expanse. Your job is to say fuck you to the nature that created aging and death and to have as many lifetimes in one as possible just to be able 
to sneer at death with a triumphant smile. Over here, yes. So Is Charlie, the most difficult scene to cut, and Howard, a scene that didn't make the film that you would have liked to have made it in. Do you mean cut as in like edit, or cut as in to like take out of the film? All right, do you, do you have yours ready, Howard? I no, because I have no idea of what all the footage amounted to. Um, it's a great question. I, I, I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot, and um, I, I had to shed so much. I mean, there's, um, I don't know, man, you really stumped me. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, most, can I pretend you said what's the, what was the hardest one to edit? <laughs> <laughs> because I will say that um, I struggled mightily with the Purdue lecture scene and actually it was close to being cut at some points um, of just, I, you know, it was the, the entire lecture was fascinating, including the Q&A even. And um, actually that was one scene that did get cut. There was a woman in the audience that had a really interesting back and forth with Howard. And then it was actually one of the consulting editors, I worked with Brian Chang's idea to flip that exchange because it was so dynamic. That was Howard doing his, that thing that he loves so much. Um, and putting that at the beginning to kind of like start with that energy. Um, and then I actually, I ended up filming with that woman because she's like this amazing local artist in, in uh, at Purdue and, um, her art is like very inspired by the cosmos and I wanted to try and weave that in there as kind of like another extension of Howard's influence and you know, somebody who was captivated um, by him. And yeah, that was again, just like lots of feedback screenings and uh, yeah, the whole Purdue scene got kind of cut down to its es essence and really became more about um, not so much like the content of what we tried to give a little bit of what Howard is talking about in that lecture, but it's more um, showing Howard on this, you know, stage and platform doing his thing, sharing his message, more about his energy than what he's saying specifically. So, yeah. And Howard, you you don't have an answer. Um, no, I mean there are little tiny details when we're talking about bacterial colonies that are seven trillion individuals in size. And despite being more in a single colony than all the humans who've ever existed, if one of those colonies was on your palm, you wouldn't be able to see it. It's so thin. So in telling the story of the stromatolites, it's very important to me to get across that what one bacterial colony accomplishes in its collective lifetime, the deposit that it leaves behind, is invisibly thin. And yet through one generation after another, leaving an invisibly thin film, these creatures create this thing the size of a mattress, with complete with a stand that holds it up this high in the air. Generation after generation after generation, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of generations. And what those bacteria accomplish, which is, as I said in the film, the equivalent of us building an entire planet, um, is this astonishment that comes through this multi-generational commitment. And that's what human culture is. So I ached for the little details of the image that couldn't make it into the film. Okay, we have a question right here. Oh, Michael, how are you? Michael and I haven't seen each other in about 30 years. <laughs> it's very interesting. I was at the house in Brooklyn 15 or 20 times when Howard was in bed. And I was there many times when you couldn't talk. So you were writing on the computer. And I remember having a long and deep inspirational intellectual conversation with you over probably 10 years or 12 years. And my wife was telling me that this guy in Brooklyn is crazy. 
Why? And I, but I don't even remember what took us there, and we stopped seeing each other. But when I got this invitation, it brings up so it was an amazing experience. His Michael's wife said to him, "Why are you in love with this guy?" In other words, she was jealous. Uh, <laughs> How many different kinds of people were coming into your life at that time that had come in and disappeared? Because it's it's very interesting. I have no idea, you know, how that happened. Well, Michael was a part of a very strange process. If you've never been in solitary confinement, you have no idea of what it is. When you are stuck in solitary confinement, which I was with this illness, your body starts creating all kinds of tortures for which there are no words in the English language. And your sense of self dissipates as if it were taken into an aerosol and sprayed into the air and disappears as droplets in the air. And it's only when another person is in the room with you that your personality comes back together from that aerosol as a singular thing. And you get an hour and a half or two hours of salvation, two hours in which you're almost normal. I mean, you can't get out of the bed, but you're almost normal. And but those two hours happen very, very rarely. And seven days a week, you are in this aerosolized condition of unspeakable pain. So the very few people who came over to see me, the other one was Richard Foreman. Richard Foreman is the MacArthur Genius Award winner, an officer of the Order in Arts, Arts and Letters in France, um, and the founder of the Ontological Hysterical Theater. And I got a call one day saying, well, uh, you know, I, I don't normally do this, but uh, uh, I've read your books, and uh, uh, would, would you mind if I came over? And in those days, we didn't yet have Google, but we had some primitive search engines. It finally occurred to me, I was desperate. Anybody who said that, if it was Jack the Ripper, fine. <laughs> um, and it finally occurred to me to use the primitive search engines to try to figure out who this individual that had called me on the phone was. And it turned out to be Richard Foreman, the god of avant-garde theater. Um, so it was you, Michael, for which bless you, thank you. Um, and it was Richard Foreman and the people I would gather to meet with Richard because I found it very hard to get Richard to come out of his shell when he came over one-on-one. -on -one. And I found the most effective way of getting a sense of Richard was to put him together with other people who would draw him out, like Carl Zimmer, who writes science. He's a brilliant science writer for the New York Times, um, friends of that caliber. And so these people came out and saved me perhaps once every three weeks. And you can't even imagine what the rest of those three weeks without people was like. It was an impossible torture. So I owe you huge thanks. I, remember, I mean, I, I haven't been in that apartment in 20 years. I just, when I saw that in the film, it was just amazing. I was there so often. And thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you all so much for joining us. That is all the time. Uh, that He's in the film. Yeah. Hi hello, Mr. Coons. Ted, Ted let, let me just. And he took a course with in, in 1967. <laughs> and I want to tell you that it was a very, very difficult course. <laughs> but I want to tell you that that Howard got an A+. Plus. <laughs> and since I am, whatever AG is, I have some years on me. I'm 90, and I still can tell you to keep going, Howard. Life ahead, and I want to give you a final grade. A+, plus, and that goes for you, too. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ted. Oh, man. Thank you, Mr. Coons. It couldn't have ended it any better. Charlie, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Howard. Thank you very thank much. Thank you all for joining us.